It's Easter of the year 1282. Dissatisfied nobleman Davith ap Griffith, brother to the Prince of Wales, launches an attack on the royal Harden Castle, overseeing the Anglo-Welsh border. Action which invariably sparks a revolt that spreads over the entire country. Upon hearing of this, King Edward of England is outraged and orders his subordinates to gather armed hosts to deal with the insurgents. The war that would decide Welsh independence is about to begin. This video is sponsored by Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a documentary-based streaming service that is sure to leave you spoiled for choice. With a gallery boasting thousands of videos to choose from, there's sure to be something that sparks one's interest. A good recommendation would be The Real War of Thrones, an exploration of the dynastic powers that formed Europe during its early centuries. But it isn't just history you'll find. Science, technology, nature, and many other topics can be found. And just for $3 a month, you'll get full access to their film library. But if you use the link in the description below and use the promotional code BASBATTLES, you'll get a 30-day trial absolutely free. Available on all major platforms, Curiosity Stream has some of the top award-winning documentaries in the world. Follow the link in the description below and see for yourself. It's early summer of the year 1265. A good chunk of medieval Wales is under the control of Llewellyn ap Griffith, grandson of the famous Llewellyn the Great and the self-styled Prince of Wales. Though having a somewhat challenging start, being the second of four ever quarrelling sons, he managed to emerge as the sole ruler of the Principality of Gwynedd. This was a solid achievement, but Llewellyn's ambitions went well beyond that. He was well aware of the ongoing problems the English crown faced with unruly barons, and having essentially free reign in Wales, Llewellyn extended his authority over neighbouring Welsh states, eventually claiming the title of Prince of Wales. When the turmoil in England escalated into full-fledged civil war, Llewellyn obviously capitalised on this, seeking means to strengthen his position in the region. Since the English Kingdom fell recently under the de facto rule of rebelling Simon de Montfort, Llewellyn offered him military support in exchange for recognition of his title and territorial gains. Although de Montfort's career soon came to an end, as he was killed and dismembered by English forces loyal to the crown in the Battle of Evesham in the late summer of 1265, Llewellyn took advantage of the weak position of the freshly reinstated King Henry. He pressed him to sign a treaty acknowledging Llewellyn's hegemony over Wales. In such a manner, Llewellyn became the only ruler from Gwynedd to be formally recognised by the English king as Prince of Wales. Llewellyn's good run continued for several years, during which he focused on maintaining dominance in Wales and curbing the ambitions of the neighbouring marcher lords. This situation, however, slowly started to change, following the death of King Henry in late 1272. The crown now belonged to Henry's talented son, Edward, who happened to be abroad at the time of his father's death, on his way back from the crusade. Undoubtedly, Llewellyn was well aware that Edward's ascension to the throne would open a new chapter in mutual relations between England and Wales, but he certainly wasn't prepared for what was to happen in the next several years. In early 1274, Llewellyn's brother, Davith, along with other Welsh magnates, plotted to kill Llewellyn and divide his power amongst themselves. Yet the assassination attempt failed, as the would-be killers got stuck in a snowstorm and didn't reach their target in time. Llewellyn had soon discovered the conspiracy, and Davith was forced to flee to England. This scheme wasn't particularly extraordinary on its own, as assassination plots were somewhat common back then, but this one sparked events fostering a lot of bad blood between Prince Llewellyn and King Edward. When the latter was travelling through the Welsh marches in 1275, he urged Llewellyn to come along and pay homage to the new king. The Welsh prince refused to do so, citing Edward's harbouring of conspirators, including the prince's treacherous brother, Davith. Since King Edward was noticeably more temperamental and ambitious than his late father Henry, Llewellyn's disobedience outraged the English king. What's more, the Welsh prince made attempts to marry into the de Montfort family by wedding a daughter of the traitor Simon de Montfort, an act which was regarded as a direct affront to the king of England. 
Friction between the two rulers continued well into 1276, and in November of that year, Llewellyn was declared a rebel and enemy of the crown. War was imminent. With preparations complete, in July of 1277, some 15,000 men, led by King Edward himself, invaded Wales. One might think that Llewellyn's audacious, bordering on reckless, behavior towards the English king had some backing in terms of military potential. But the truth was that by the time of Edward's invasion, the Welsh prince enjoyed little support from his fellow countrymen, especially outside of Gwynedd, and was simply unable to muster a host strong enough to defy the invaders. In fact, a solid part of the royal force consisted of troops provided by various Welsh chieftains discontented by Llewellyn's hegemony. Therefore, Edward's campaign was swift, as Llewellyn avoided any direct confrontation. By early November, royal troops enforced direct English control over almost the entirety of Wales. Although Llewellyn kept a grip over his power base of Gwynedd, the eastern part of his principality was ceded to the English crown, while the remaining portion of the land was granted by Edward to Llewellyn's brother, Davith. Thus, in the span of a few months, virtually all of Llewellyn's territorial acquisitions of the last 20 years fell into the hands of the English crown. Edward also ensured that Welsh autonomous rule would end upon Llewellyn's death, though he was allowed to keep his now merely nominal title of Prince of Wales. In order to tighten his grip over the conquered lands, Edward erected a tight-knit chain of castles encompassing Gwynedd and reorganized the conquered districts as shires and hundreds. A period of fragile peace followed as the Welsh tried to get used to this new reality. But as time passed, local nobility grew disillusioned by direct English rule and voices of concern grew gradually louder and more numerous. In the spring of 1282, when discontent among Welsh chieftains was already widespread, Llewellyn's brother, Davith, displeased by the rewards Edward granted to him, rose up in a rebellion, burning some of the English strongpoints in northern Wales. Davith's insurrection soon spilled out all over the country as the aggrieved Welsh chieftains followed the sentiment and rose up against English rule. Prince Llewellyn, though not involved in Davith's uprising at first, soon felt duty-bound to join in taking the lead and trying to organize the rebels. Since the revolt was rather spontaneous, the Welsh were ill-prepared for the war against the occupiers. This time, the enraged King Edward was determined to quell the unruly Welsh once and for all, so he used three separate forces to conquer the region. The beginning of the war, however, looked promising for the Welsh, as they managed to win several battles by ambushing overconfident English commanders and inflicting some significant losses, which eventually forced Edward to conscript more troops in England. Though involving a great amount of resources and men, King Edward's Welsh campaign remained stalling by the end of December 1282, whereas the uprising was still going strong. At this time, Llewellyn was operating in central Wales, attempting to divert at least some of the English pressure from Gwynedd and relieve his brother Davith fighting there. Around the 10th of December, Llewellyn rested near the town of Bulth, at the crossroads of the key routes within central Wales. The sources don't give a plain explanation as to Llewellyn's motives in the area, but among the most popular are that he was either tricked by the enemy into peace talks with Lord Mortimer, who commanded the English military effort in mid-Wales, or that he simply was determined to destroy Mortimer's army. In any case, by the morning of the 11th of December, Llewellyn's host was camping but a stone's throw away from Booth, guarding the bridge over the River Irvine. At his disposal were around 7,000 men, which, excluding Llewellyn's mounted houseguard, consisted entirely of spear infantry. In comparison, Lord Mortimer, who soon approached from the south, led a slightly less numerous host of just more than 6,000 soldiers. His force composition, however, was comprised of a balanced mix between footmen, heavy cavalry, and archers. Prince Llewellyn took up a defensive position, concentrating on defending the passage through the bridge. Since Mortimer yearned to attack first, he was at a significant tactical disadvantage as storming the bridge head-on would essentially mean suicide. But the English commander had an ace up his sleeve. Either one of his men or a local guide hinted that there was a ford crossing nearby, 
seemingly unguarded by Llewellyn's forces. Having little to lose, Mortimer sent some of his men to cross the ford and try launch a flanking maneuver on the Welsh. The ploy worked, as an English detachment successfully passed over the river, and soon, archer volleys rained down upon the surprised Welsh, who after their initial disorientation, reformed and dashed at the flanking English, leaving the bridge unattended. This was exactly what Lord Mortimer had hoped for. English cavalry rushed to cross the bridge, followed by the remainder of the infantry. Seeing the enemy movement on the bridge, the Welsh realized the danger and began to withdraw towards the hill at all cost, in a struggle to avoid the attack from the rear. This move cost many lives, but the retreat was more or less in order as the English flanking infantry didn't pursue the enemy. Still, it was a cold comfort for Llewellyn's troops, as in the meantime, Mortimer's heavy cavalry completed lining up and the blare of the horns signaled the attack. The riders rushed out of their positions and furiously struck the Welsh infantry. Llewellyn's weakened troops were not able to organize in time to resist the charge. Hundreds perished in the first strike and the rest, unable to hold off the English pressure, broke and fled the battlefield, trying to save their lives. Sources differ on how and where Llewellyn died, but it's plausible that he was killed in either phase of the battle. The Welsh death toll amounted to roughly 2,000, but it was the prince's death that shook the rebellion. Abruptly stripped of his leadership and authority, southern and central Wales were soon subjugated by King Edward's forces. Davith, who took the title of Prince of Wales, somehow resisted the English in Gwynedd until June of the next year, when he shared the fate of his brother and was executed by the English. The Welsh Rebellion of 1282 met a dreadful end. Prince Llewellyn, posthumously dubbed as Llewellyn the Last, was virtually the last fully independent Welsh prince. Despite strong resistance of the Welsh people, King Edward's methodical campaign and skillful leadership allowed him to absorb the entire country into the English crown. Though the Welsh maintained their identity and carried out other revolts in subsequent decades, King Edward and his successors made sure to maintain English dominance in Wales for the centuries to come.